This morning, I'm going to turn your attention to Scripture, and I'm going to invite you to turn with me to John chapter 4, which you can find in your Bible and a Bible under the seats in front of you uh, or on your mobile device. Of course, you are also always welcome to simply listen as I read today's passage. Uh, now, last week, as we kicked off this series on spiritual formation, we introduced the concept of spiritual formation, uh, which I'm defining as seeking God in order that we might be changed by God so that we might join God in His purposes. I'll say that again. I'm defining spiritual formation as seeking God in order that we might be changed by God so that we might join God in His purposes. If you missed the introduction last week, don't worry. You can actually find last week's sermon on our web website, kelseycreek.church. Uh, but this week, we're going to build on that introduction and begin looking at a pattern for spiritual formation, which we also introduced last week. Uh, this pattern, uh, which Henry now has famously observed in the Gospel of Luke, this idea of solitude leading to community, leading to ministry, uh, it can be found in all four Gospels. We're looking at it in the Gospel of John because John offers some really helpful commentary about the work of the Spirit, which is really helpful when you're talking about the work of spiritual formation. If you want to know more about the Gospel of John or about Henry Nouwen, you can check out last week's sermon. But right now I'm going to invite you to join me in reading this passage from John chapter 4. We're going to read the, verse, the first 26 verses, and we're going to look for this pattern of spiritual formation. Let's read this together. Though. John chapter, one, chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired, from, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water, of li the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't, be th won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you, are, you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on, on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So do you see the pattern there? It's okay if you didn't. It's not super obvious on the surface. And technically, we would have to read the full chapter to see the full pattern. What we can see, though, in the, in the 26 verses we read is we can see the first part of this pattern, and that would be the work of solitude. Now, you may be thinking, well, hold on a second. Solitude? Where do you see solitude in this passage? I don't see this woman alone. Jesus is with her the whole time. I say, exactly. Solitude isn't about being alone. Solitude is actually about being alone with God. And I say that because the reality is no one is ever technically alone. 
Scripture reminds us repeatedly that God is always present with all of us, even those who may not know him as of yet. Solitude is not about being alone. It's about being alone with God. And because none of us is ever away from God, we might say that solitude, more, more importantly, is about paying attention to God when we're alone with him. Of course, still you may be thinking, okay, that's fine. Where's the woman alone with God? She's just alone with Jesus. And I say, exactly. The woman says in verse 25, you know, the Messiah, the Christ, when he comes, he, he, he'll explain everything to us. And Jesus says, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Actually, literally it says, I, the one speaking to you, I am. The words I am are, are pretty significant here. And they're significant every time Jesus says them in the Gospel of John, which he says quite regularly. They're significant because the words I am are words that no Jew would ever utter. That's because the words I am is the name I am. It's the name that God revealed to Moses. It's the sacred name of God. It's the holy name of God that Jews were fearful to ever utter. No Jew would ever say these things because they were afraid that this name was so holy that God would actually strike them dead for being so unholy. And yet Jesus says, I am. Every time Jesus says, I am in the Gospels, which he does quite regularly, what he's saying is, I am God. If you don't believe me that that's what he's saying, you should read the Gospel of John, specifically places like John chapter 8 or John chapter 10, where Jesus says these things and people are ready to kill him. And not just because Jesus is saying the name of God, but because he is claiming that is his name. He is claiming, I am God. I don't want to belabor the point, but I do want you to understand that every time Jesus says, I am, like he does right here, he's saying, I am God. And what that means is this woman who is alone with Jesus in John 4 is actually alone with God himself. Now, if you want to uh, unpack that a bit more, come see me afterwards and we'll talk about the significance of this. But right now, I, I want you to take a look with me just briefly at how this woman ends up being alone with God. And more importantly, what happens when she is. Now John says in verse 3 that Jesus had to go through Samaria. The quickest way to get from Galilee to Jerusalem was through Samaria. The problem is, is no Jew ever went through Samaria. Jews went around Samaria. They literally went miles out of their way because Samaria was more or less considered to be the wrong side of the tracks. Specifically, Samaria was where these kind of people who had distorted Scripture, or at least ignored parts of it, and who had mixed with other races. It's where these people who had been engaged in culture wars and sometimes literal wars with the people of Judea, it's where those people lived. Jews didn't go through Samaria, and yet Jesus, who was a Jew, went through Samaria because John said he had to go through Samaria. The thing is, John... It's not saying that Jesus had to because it's the only way. There was, a, there was a well-worn path around Samaria. Jesus had to go through Samaria because he had a divine appointment with a woman at a well. Now, the thing about wells in the ancient world is there's a little more going on at wells than you think. In fact, you might think of wells in the ancient world kind of like modern-day dating apps or maybe like singles bars. What I mean is, if you read the Old Testament, you will find a lot of men meeting a lot of women at wells. Case in point, Jacob, the man for whom this well is named after, guess where he met his wife at? A well. The thing is, the woman at this well isn't looking to meet a man. In fact, she's not looking to meet anyone. And we know this because this woman is at Jacob's well at high noon. People didn't go to get water in the middle of the day, neither in Judea or Samaria, because it's too hot to get water in the middle of the day. Everyone in their right mind would go get their water first thing in the morning when it's still cool, or really late at night when you can actually bear it. But this woman is here in the middle of the day. Why? Because she doesn't want to be around anyone. This woman is looking to be alone, and yet she finds herself alone with Jesus who asks her, she's beginning to lower her bucket into the well, will you give me something to drink? Now, I don't know if she assumes this is a pickup line or not, because, you know, that's what happened at wells. But she 
instantly tries to shut this conversation down. She says, hey, this really shouldn't be happening. You shouldn't be talking to me. And not just because you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan and, you know, we don't interact. Men and women didn't really interact one-on-one in the ancient world, not unless something else was going on. I mean, you can almost imagine the thoughts that might be starting to form in her mind, like, really, again? Jesus continues, though, and he says, if you knew the gift of God that I am, you would be asking me for living water. She says, wait, how are you going to give me water? You don't have a bucket. (laughs) And Jesus more or less responds by saying, I'm not talking about water in this well. I'm talking about something better. I'm talking about something deeper. And then Jesus says something here in John 4 that is reminiscent of what he says in John 7. It's the passage we looked at last week. He says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I don't know if the Samaritan woman like missed the part about eternal life or she's really confused by what is really an odd pickup line, but she's kind of like, hey, that actually sounds pretty good. Could you give me some of that water so I don't have to come back to this well? And this is when Jesus begins to steer the conversation in a new direction to, to a deeper level. He says, go call your husband. And the woman says, well, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, I know. I know that you've had five husbands, and I know that you're hooking up with number six right now. And at this point, the woman realizes that something is up. She says, well, I can see that you're a prophet. In other words, I can see that you're religious. Let's talk about religion so we don't have to talk about me. She, She knows something up, so she steers the conversation in a different direction. And then she tries to, to, to spark this debate. It's actually a debate that Jews and Samaritans have been having for centuries, this debate about where worship should be and about who God is. But Jesus being the wise person that he is, or Jesus being God, he doesn't take the bait. And instead of getting caught up in this theological debate, Jesus really speaks to the heart of worship, or that is, he speaks to the work of spiritual formation. This is what causes the woman to ask this question about the Messiah, to talk about the Christ. And Jesus says, hey, you're looking at him. I am the Christ. I'm God in the flesh. Come to rescue people like you. Come to actually rescue you. And it's at this moment that we begin to see the work of spiritual formation taking root in this woman's life. Now, over the next couple of weeks, we'll we'll look at how this translates to community and into ministry, which, if you remember, the other two parts of this pattern of spiritual formation, significant portions. But we're going to spend our time today looking at the first part of this. That would be the work of solitude. Simply put, something happens when we spend time alone with God. It's where healing begins to happen. It's where transformation begins to take place. It's what we see in this woman's life, and it's actually what we ourselves experience as well. Something happens when we spend time alone with God. Now, maybe not all the time, but at times, over time. Spiritual formation begins when we're alone, we pay attention to God, because that's where the living water that Jesus promises, the living water which John identifies as the Holy Spirit in John chapter 7, it's where the Spirit begins to well up within us. It's where He begins to transform us from the inside out, and it's where we actually begin to find uh, nourishment, relief, satisfaction for our weary and parched souls. It's where we find something that we can't find anywhere else on this planet. You know, a number of years ago, I uh, led a mission trip on the other side of the planet, actually, in a country called Romania. We did a lot of things on this trip, but one of the significant things that we did is we traveled to really isolated and remote parts of Romania, and we would travel into these villages where we would help assess some basic needs, which we would try to set up systems to address those, where we'd spend some time uh, sharing the gospel, uh, and where we spent getting some time encouraging churches to begin. Our entry point at every one of these villages 
was soccer, or as the rest of the world calls it, football. We would show up in these remote villages, we would walk out into the middle of the field, and we would just hold up a soccer ball, and then within minutes, we would be surrounded by villagers who would come out and destroy us in soccer. Seriously, we would, we would play games and just get humiliated, but it opened up opportunities for us to get to know them and, and to begin to assess needs in the community and to share the gospel, and we would do this over snacks. We would then go play more soccer and get crushed in every game of soccer we played. It was a pretty remarkable trip, but it was not without incident, mostly because the beverage that we served in those snacks was sparkling water, or as my kids call it, static water. I happen to like sparkling water. My kids tell me it tastes like you hit your funny bone. But anyway, in the country of Romania, we were serving sparkling water because it's the only thing that we could really guarantee was actually clean, that it wouldn't actually make you sick. You knew it had been treated because it had bubbles in it. And so we would serve uh, this sparkling water, this static water, in between soccer games. The problem is, it never satisfies your thirst. I mean, you think it does, but it doesn't. And if you don't believe me, go run a few miles today and chug a LaCroix and see how you feel. There's a time and a place for sparkling water, especially if they've got a little bit of flavor, but they don't satisfy your thirst. And, and, I, and I, every time I would drink them and we were playing soccer, I would think it would for a minute, but then I would run out onto the field and I could not get rid of the thirst in my mouth. And so I'd come back and I kept drinking more and more sparkling water, but the more I drank, the, 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 I just could not satisfy my thirst. In fact, all I found was I had a really bloated belly at the end of the day. And a great illustration for John chapter 4. We only find satisfaction when we deep drink from the deep resources of the water that Jesus promises us. We, we only find nourishment, refreshment in the things that Jesus offers us by way of his life, death, and resurrection. The things that the Spirit of God begins to pour out within us. It is only there that we actually find what we're looking for, what we're made for. Everything else that we consume, everything else that we pursue, even the good gifts of God, they might be good, but they are not good enough to satisfy what it is that we're looking for. It is only when we drink from the deep recesses of the God who made us that we begin to understand and to find satisfaction and nourishment and refreshment from our souls. What I'm trying to say is only in knowing the God of the universe, in spending time alone with Him, that we actually begin to satisfy that spiritual thirst. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't a place for other people and the gifts of God, which community is. In fact, we'll be talking about community and ministry over the next couple of weeks. It's just that community and ministry don't happen without solitude. I might say that community and ministry are incomplete without the work of solitude. I mean, you can find good things in the gift of community. You can find friendship, companionship, but you won't find transformation in community unless you begin to experience it when you're alone with God. That's because you will never be able to show up fully in community until God does some work within you. In the same way, ministry is a critical thing, do, uh, participating in the works of God. You know, people do good things in the world all the time, but it is only participation in the works of God when we know the eternal God. Good works are good, but eternal work only happens when the God of the universe works in us. There's, a point, there's an important pattern that leads to community and ministry, but it begins with solitude. It begins by getting to know the eternal God who has made us. It, it, it begins with the eternal God beginning to help us know some things about ourselves. In fact, I would invite you to look with me at John 4 just for a brief moment here to catch a glimpse of what solitude looks like, to see the work that God begins to do in us that translates and leads to these other important things. Something happens when you spend time alone with God. It's where healing and it's where transformation takes place. And it begins because God begins to expose some things in your life. Did you notice that Jesus unearthed some things in this woman's life that she was trying to hide from everyone else? Jesus exposes some things, not because he's trying to condemn her, but because he's trying to open the door to healing. He's trying to help her see that she is never going to satisfy these eternal longings with temporal things. 
It's when she's alone with Jesus that Jesus begins to expose these things that are out of order in her life. These sins that are actually bringing shame and guilt into her life. You can expect that when you spend time alone with God, that God is going to unearth some things in your life. Not all the time, but at times. And while it may sound really unpleasant to think about God unearthing some things that we try to hide, in fact, it is often unpleasant. It is absolutely necessary because that's the path to healing. It's actually where we begin to unburden our souls. It's actually where we find liberation. And again, it's actually where we begin to find the hope to enjoy real community. Because when God begins to heal the things within us, to deliver us from the things that cause guilt and shame, we actually don't have to hide from each other anymore. We're actually set free to enjoy the gift of each other. You can expect when you practice solitude, when you spend time alone with God, that God is perhaps going to unearth some things in your life. Not to condemn you, but to bring healing. In the same way, God is going to, when you spend time with him, likely reveal some things to you, some truth, to provide some direction to your life. And again, this is what we see in John 4. Notice how Jesus really gently corrects this woman's misunderstanding about worship, and more importantly, about God. Then we can expect God to do the same, to actually lead us in ways of truth, to actually teach us new things, or to correct some things in our lives. Now, of course, I should say this, that the things that we learn when we're alone, we should actually bring them into community with us. Because while God's Word is perfect, sometimes our interpretation is it isn't. And so sometimes the new things that we're learning are helpful to test out and, and, and to discern and, and together, so we might refine these truths. At the same time, too, you can't expect to just show up and have other people pouring truth into you. What I mean is that the truth that God speaks begins in the work of solitude. In fact, I would say that the public work that God does among us is really an overflow of the private work that God does alone with us. It's why solitude is so critical. There's some amazing things that happen in the context of community. But it will never be what it could be, what it should be, what it was satisfying to your soul and to the God of the universe pours himself out within you. And so the invitation is to practice spiritual formation starting with solitude. Spending time alone with the God who made you and knows you and fills you up. Of course, the question is, well, what does that look like? I mean, it's one thing to talk about a woman who shows up at a well and has Jesus physically sitting in front of her. What does solitude look like for us? What, what is this practice that we're talking about, that we actually spend time alone with God? What should that look like in our lives? You know, there's no one-size-fits-all solution here, because the reality is... We're all wired a little bit differently. We all have different rhythms. We all have different learning styles, and we have different thresholds for sitting still for, by ourselves. And so I can't tell you exactly what it looks like for you, but I can give you some general guidelines that I would encourage you to think about. And the first would be to start your day with solitude. And the reason I would say start your day with solitude is because it is too easy, if you try to put things off to the end of the day, to forget about it. Or just to be too tired. And you know, there's nothing wrong. It's a beautiful thing to fall asleep in prayer at the end of the day. You're probably cutting yourself off from this nourishment that we're talking about. In the same way that I don't wait to the end of the day to finally drink some water, you might not want to wait to the end of the day to have God begin to well, to well himself up within you. You can absolutely end your day that well, but I recommend starting the day. Maybe first thing, or at least when you've had your coffee and you're alert, find a space to do this. Start your day with solitude and see if you don't begin to notice God throughout your day. Second thing, be realistic. You know, it's really easy to say, okay, we're talking about spiritual formation, and so I'm going to commit to this, and I'm going to practice an hour of solitude each day. That is a noble goal, 
But chances are, if you set a goal like that and you don't already have an established rhythm and set of practices in your life, you are probably going to get discouraged and perhaps even give up. If you set unrealistic goals, noble and yet unrealistic goals, you are probably going to give up because you're going to find yourself, if you have young kids in the house (laughs) or a crazy work schedule, you're going to find yourself disappointed and giving up. And so the idea is to start with some realistic goals. Maybe, maybe some of you may have this in your practice in your life already. Stick with it. But those of you who may be trying to think about a new rhythm in your life, you might want to start with something attainable. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and let it grow. If you accidentally spend an hour with God, thanks be to God, right? Or if you only can find that happening on the weekends when time is a little slower, be thankful for that. The idea is be realistic. Don't shortchange yourself your time with God, but don't also miss out on it because you set an unattainable goal that just brings guilt on you. Find a rhythm that works for you. Be realistic. Thirdly, find your practices. Emphasis on yours. And the reason I emphasize yours is because What works for some may not work for all. Now, I do think that it's it's important that spiritual formation is rooted in prayer in Scripture because that seems to be universal. It's just that how we engage in prayer in Scripture can vary widely. I mean, for example, when it comes to prayer, there's contemplative prayer and liturgical prayers and intercessory prayers and journaling prayers and so on and so on. When it comes to Scripture, you can memorize it or meditate on it or study it via a modern technique like an inductive Bible study or an ancient one like Lectio Divina. What I'm trying to say is you don't have to do exactly what your friend or your spouse or your small group is doing. You have a different learning style and a different rhythm. You don't have to copy and paste But you have an invitation to find the practices that work for you, that help you begin to know the God who made you in his image, the God who rescues us in his son, and the God who transforms us by his spirit. It may take some trial and error to find the right practices in your life. It's okay. It it may take you acknowledging, man, the things that really were good for me in in the previous season are not working right now. It's okay to admit that. In fact, it's important to admit that and to be willing to consider some new ways. The goal is not that you are a slave to the practices, but that you find yourself being able to pay attention to God through practices. You know, I tell you what, let me give you a starting point for this. If you're thinking, well, where would be a good place for me to start? Let me point you to two resources. One is actually on our new website, kelseycreek.church. There is a reading plan from the Gospel of John that you will find on there right now. There's a reading plan that we actually hope to to update with each sermon series. What you'll find is a passage of Scripture, and you will find some prayer prompts and some questions. In fact, you will find the ancient practice of Lectio Divina right here on our website. You don't have to do this. You might have your own rhythm. If, that's, that's, if you've got your own practices, thanks be to God. But if you're looking for something that maybe would be helpful, maybe that might be interesting to, to fuel your time in community, this is a great place to start. Look for the reading plan on our website. The second place that you might want to start is with the Face Practices Project on the CRC's website. This is not quite as straightforward because there's not a reading plan, but there are a whole bunch of practices. Remember I said there's a bunch of practices that work differently for different people? Here's a great place to find some things that might be a little bit out of, uh, outside of your normal box. You probably can't practice all these things, but you might actually try some of them and find the one that actually is refreshing in a different way. So check out the CRC's website, the Faith Practices Project. Check out our website. Or you know what? Come have a conversation with me or with your elder or your teacher in spiritual formation classes. The key thing is you don't have to do this alone, but the invitation is to recognize that something happens when you spend time alone with God. That's where God opens the door to healing. It's where God begins to actually be, begin his work of transformation. And it's where he begins to change the things in your life, including the opportunities for community and ministry. So in this season, as we begin to think about spiritual formation, I invite you not just to wait until programming starts, 
But to start where Scripture invites us to start, to start where Jesus himself started, with solitude. It's there that we begin seeking God in order to be changed by God, that we might join God in his purposes. May you find this in your life. And may God be pleased to be at work in our lives. Let's pray.